the Get Ready For series. Um, this is going to be a video lecture to help you get ready for sixth grade science. I'll be your instructor for the video. My name is Brian Cacuzzo. I am a third year medical student at Nova Southeastern, which means I'm in my third out of four years of studying to be a doctor. Um, so today we're going to be covering the cool topic of human pedigrees. So let's jump into what those are. So to understand those, we need to go over a couple of vocab words. So a human pedigree, maybe you've heard of pedigree like the dog food. So what a pedigree is referring to is genetics. It's a chart that shows you how genes get passed through generations. So in other words, how a trait that you have, it could be your hair color, it could be your eye color, it could be how tall you are, or it could be a genetic disease gets passed down through generations. So how things get from the first generation, say here the great grandparents, to the second generation, say here the grandparents, to the parents, to the children. So to understand pedigrees, there are a few types of traits. So there are dominant traits. So this means when you inherit genes, you inherit one copy from your mom, one copy from your dad. So some things about you look like your mom, some things about you look like your dad. So say your mom has brown hair and your dad has blonde hair. You're going to wind up with a color and maybe your brother wound up with a different color. That's because you inherited traits from both your mom and your dad and one trait dominated the other. So a dominant trait is something that shows up if you get it. So basically, if you get one copy of that gene, so if you get it from your mom or you get it from your dad, you show that gene. And there's a disease that we'll be talking about a little bit later today that follows a dominant pattern. And that disease is called Huntington's disease. What Huntington's disease is, is that it's a movement disease and it's a cognitive disease. So that means that people lose the ability to control their movements, their arms and legs and things move without them telling them to. And they lose their ability to think and remember. So they have difficulty with memory. They have difficulty with reasoning and problem solving. A recessive trait is one that shows up if you get it from both parents. So if your mom gives you that trait and your dad gives you that trait, not every trait that you get is necessarily expressed. If you're given a recessive trait, but only from one parent, it won't be expressed. And one disease that we're going to be talking about in a little bit that is recessive is a disease called hemophilia. And hemophilia is a bleeding disease. It's a disease where if you get a cut or you get some type of injury, your blood doesn't clot well. Or in other words, you don't form a good scab to help you stop bleeding. So the next vocabulary word we need to understand is a carrier. If someone is a carrier for a disease, that means that person has the trait so they can pass the disease to someone else. But they don't have the disease. So in other words, this would be a healthy parent but they would have a sick kid. To have a sick kid with a recessive disease, both parents have to give the trait. So either one parent is sick and one is a carrier, or both parents are carriers. So hemophilia 
That's the pedigree that we're going to be looking at. We said that is a blood clotting disease. It means your blood doesn't clot well. You get a cut and you don't stop bleeding. So this pedigree chart is going to help us answer questions. So this is the way the chart works. We read from top to bottom. So the people on top, they're the oldest. And the people on the bottom, they're the youngest. So you can remember that adults are tall, kids are short, so the young people are on the bottom. Each line represents a generation. And those are represented with Roman numeral numbers. So generations go down. So they count down generation one, generation two, generation three, generation four. In each row, that includes the people in this generation. So the people are labeled with an Arabic number, meaning a normal one, two, three. So we could label a person, generation one, person one, generation one, person two. So let's say I wanted to name this person here. This person is in row one, so they're generation one. And they are person one. It turns out these shapes and colors have a meaning too. So first off, guys are squares. So if you see a square like this, it's a male. Girls are circles. So if you see a circle like this, it's a female. People that are colored in, whether male or female, are people that are affected. And the lines show you the relationship of the people. So if you see a line like this within the same generation, connecting two people to each other, those two people are married. So a vertical line between, or horizontal line between a man and a woman like this, that means that man and that woman are married. If you see a line coming down from one couple to some people, this line means that is their child or children. So it's possible that you will see a couple with multiple lines coming out of them like this. That means that these people, they have the same parents so anybody who's joined by a bar like this, those people are siblings. So let's say this is me here. And my sister gets married. So we connect a person here. This is marriage. And then those two go on to have some children. These are my nieces and nephews. And let's say I go on to have some children too. These people here, they're not tied together, but they're in the same generation. So these people here are cousins. These people here our siblings again. And these people here, they gave birth to all of these parents. 
So these people now, congrats to them. They're now grandparents. So we can use a pedigree to find out a lot of information. Let's say we don't know if somebody is a carrier. So we know that this person is not sick. We know that this person is sick. This person has hemophilia because it says a pedigree, a square represents a male. If he is darkened, he has hemophilia. So this person, we know he has hemophilia. These people we know do not. But they have a child that does. If they have a child that does, that means both of them had to have given one trait for hemophilia to the child. That means we can definitively say that both of these two people, they are carriers. So they have the possibility to give the trait to someone. You may see on a pedigree a carrier represented as a person that is half shaded in. If a person is half shaded in, that means they have the trait, but they do not expect it. They do not express it. So you may see something like this. That means the person is a carrier. Not all charts will show you carriers. Some will only show you if the person is sick or well. So you can't assume, because you don't see this, that the person is not a carrier. You can tell these people are carriers because they are healthy, but they had this sick son here. So we can use this pedigree chart to answer some questions. How many males are there? Males are squares. It doesn't ask, are they sick? It doesn't ask, are they well? It doesn't ask anything about them. It just asks males. So this is one male, two males, three males, four males, five males, six males, seven males, eight males. Looks like there are eight. This is male one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many males have hemophilia? So we want them to be male and have hemophilia. So that means we're looking for darkened males. One, two, three. There are three males with hemophilia. How many females are there? So this is asking us just to count the circles. Females are circles of any kind. One female, two females, three females, four females, five females, six females, seven females, eight females. Eight females. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. How many females have hemophilia? So we're looking only for shaded females now. She does, she does. Two females with hemophilia. A marriage is indicated by a horizontal line connecting a circle to a square. So anytime there's a horizontal line, between a man and a woman, they're married. How many marriages are there? There's this marriage. There's this marriage. There's this marriage. These guys are siblings because they have vertical lines down to them. So there are three marriages. A line perpendicular to a marriage indicates the offspring. So anytime there is a line coming off of a marriage like this, that indicates an offspring. If the line is connected to another horizontal line, then several children are produced, each by a short vertical line. So what that means is this horizontal line has this vertical line has a horizontal line coming out of it with multiple vertical lines. That means this marriage they had these three children. Not him. He married her. So she is like an in-law. These are the three children of the parents. The one's coming directly off of it. She just married the son. So him, her, and him are the children of these people. 
she is the wife or she is the daughter-in-law of these people or the wife of the son. How many children did the first couple in row one have? Find row one. Row one has this vertical line and they have one, two daughters. How many children did the third couple have? So it's telling us to look for the couple in row three. So we follow down to row one, row two, row three. Here's row three. Here's our couple. How many children did they have? We have a vertical line here and a horizontal line. That everybody that's along this horizontal line, they had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven children. Level one represents the first generation. Level two represents the second generation. How many generations are there? There's one here, two here, three here, four here. There are four generations. So let's look at this next pedigree chart here. So this one, shaded individuals have Huntington's disease. We said here that Huntington's was a disorder having to do with both thinking and moving. So these people who are shaded in, they have difficulty with thinking and moving when they are adults. This disease we said was dominant. If a disease is dominant, then just one copy of the trait, you have it. There are no carriers. So without me telling you, the way that you would see that Huntington's is dominant is here sick parent sick kids sick parent sick kids there are no instances of two well parents having a sick kid in a recessive trait if we look here here two well parents right here had a sick kid this son no well parents have any sick kids this is the only case with two well parents they do not have sick kids that means it's dominant so the first question, write the generation numbers on the pedigrees with Roman numerals. So this is the first generation. This is generation one. This next row right here, this is generation two. So write a new Roman numeral here. This next generation here, this is generation three. Which members of the family are afflicted with Huntington's or who has Huntington's. So to answer that, we have to count the people in each generation. So this is person one in this generation. This is person two in this generation. You just count them left to right. This is person one, person two, person three, person four, five, six, seven, eight. This is person one, two, three, four, and five. Who is afflicted? I need to name all of the people that are afflicted. So person, generation one, person one is afflicted. Here, generation two, person two is afflicted. Generation two, person three is afflicted. Generation two, person seven is afflicted. Generation three, person three is afflicted. Those are the sick people. There are no carriers for Huntington's disease. You either have it or you don't. So if you have the trait, you get the disease. Based on that, it is dominant. Because you only need one trait to show the disease. We had carriers with hemophilia. That's because hemophilia is 
recessive. How many children did individuals one and two have? So here we're looking at one one and one two. Here's individual one one. Here's individual one two. We want to look at their children. So we want to see the horizontal line coming out of them. They drop directly down to this child, 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 and to this child. Not person five, she married the son. Not person one, he married the daughter. Just the ones with the horizontal line coming directly down. So they had one, two, three, four, five, six children. How many girls did generation two, person one, and two have? So we're interested in this couple right here. How many girls did they have? So how many circles? They have two girls. How many of Huntington's disease? Just her. One girl. How are individuals 3, 2, and 2, 4 related? So we're interested in finding out how this person here, individual 3, 2, so how she is related to person 4, 2, to him. So it looks like he is a sibling of her mother. So he is the uncle and she is the niece. So he's a square, so he's uncle because he's a guy. She's a circle, so she's niece because she is the girl. How are 1, 2, and 3, 5 related? Person 1, 2 is right here. Person 3, 5 is right here. This looks like the mother of this person's father. She's a female, so she is grandma. He's a little boy, so he is grandson. So that relationship is grandmother, grandson. <laughs> Write the genotypes of each individual on the pedigree. So we need to choose letters to represent the genes or to represent the traits. So the best way to do this is to pick a letter that relates to the disease. So let's pick H for Huntington's disease. Big H is going to be the dominant because big letters dominate. Little h is going to be the recessive because it's less dominant. So somebody who has Huntington's is going to be big H. And because he is able to have well children, he must have the normal trait. Otherwise, if he had two copies of the Huntington trait, he would give that either way. So he must have big H and little h. Anyone who is well is automatically big H and little h. So this is person 1-1. One, one. This is person 1-2. So this person was big H, little h. This person was little h, little h. Anybody who's well definitely does not have the trait for Huntington's disease. So anybody who is well, we can automatically say little h, 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 little h. Anybody who is sick, they have to have the gene for Huntington's, but they have one well parent. So this person must have gotten this big H from dad, little H from mom. Same thing, big H from dad, little H from mom. 
same thing, big H from dad, little H from mom. This one, the mom was one with Huntington, so big H from mom, little H from dad. It doesn't matter who gave which gene, you're always going to write the dominant before the recessive. So person two, one, was little h, little h. Person two, two, was big h, little h. Person two, three, was also big h, little h, they had Huntington's. Person two, four, was also little h, little h. Person two, five, was little h, little h. Person two, six, was little h, little h. Person two, seven, was big h, little h. Person two, eight, was little h, little h. Almost there. <laughs> Person three, one was little h, little h. Person three, two was little h, little h. Person three, three was big h, little h. Person three, four and three, five were both little h, little h. So under the day, anybody sick, they have a big H and a little H. Anybody well, they have two little H's. All right, guys, so hopefully that was helpful in learning how to read pedigrees. Sixth grade is a super fun year. There are lots of new super cool concepts. Now that you know so much about pedigrees, there's so much other cool stuff in science to learn about. So definitely check out the rest of our Get Ready For series. There's other stuff. There's English. There's math. There's social studies. Um, and there's lots of other science content, so check that out and ask mom and dad to help you come online, sign up, get some tutoring, and uh, see what else you can learn. Have an awesome sixth grade year and hope to see some of you for tutoring.